In an era of deep political divide, half of registered voters in the U.S. said they expect to have difficulty casting their ballot in the 2020 election, according to a Pew Research Center poll. With early voting already underway, President Donald Trump has made a series of false statements claiming mail-in voting is rife with fraud and encouraging supporters to go into polls and watch very carefully. As far as the ballots are concerned, it's a disaster. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. In October 2020, mayoral candidate Zul Mirza Muhammad was arrested in Carlton, Texas and charged with over 100 counts of voter fraud. But according to some analysts, voter fraud on a national level in the U.S., either with mail-in ballots or at the polls, is extremely rare. The United States election system is actually very safe. There are areas where we might want to do a little better, but the general overall view of American elections is safe. I think our system is really strong because of federalism. Federalism makes it very difficult to do any sort of coordinated hacking. Millions of people are voting before Election Day in 2020, and turnout could surge to 160 million voters by November 3rd, over 16 percent more than in 2016. COVID-19 and social distancing have only added to the complexities of voting, with millions expected to vote by mail for the first time, in all but about a half a dozen states allowing some type of early in-person voting. So with fears of voter intimidation, outdated election machines, and mail-in ballot fraud, just how secure are American elections and what safeguards are in place to protect the results? While most experts agree voter fraud on a national scale is unlikely, a bigger concern for the 2020 elections, according to analysts, is voter intimidation. At the September 2020 presidential debate, President Donald Trump urged his supporters to go to the polls and look out for potential election issues. I'm go urging first. my supporters to go into the polls and watch very carefully because that's what has to happen. I am urging them to do it. Virginia Attorney General Mark Herring issued a statement calling Trump's rhetoric dangerous, saying both state and federal protections are in place to protect voters from being harassed. Nevada Attorney General Aaron Ford tweeted, Trump wasn't talking about poll watching. He was talking about voter intimidation. Poll watchers are appointed by a candidate or a political party to observe and monitor an election for potential issues. Every state has its own laws regarding poll watchers, including the number of people allowed into vote centers and what they can and cannot do. Poll watchers are an important and legal part of the democratic process. Voter intimidation is not. In January 2009, the Justice Department filed a lawsuit against the new Black Panther Party for self-defense and three of its members alleging the defendants intimidated voters in Philadelphia during the November 4, 2008 general election. A few months later, most of the charges were dropped. Poll watchers can themselves get a little rowdy too. <laughs> and they can, because they are representing a particular political side, uh, start calling out or questioning or delaying or using various tactics that are scary <laughs> and, uh, and, and essentially meant to intimidate and can intimidate even poll workers, not let alone voters. In following the 1981 New Jersey gubernatorial race, the Democratic National Committee filed a $10 million lawsuit against the Republican National Committee, accusing it of sending off-duty police officers to harass and intimidate Black and Hispanic voters. After the filing, a federal court issued a consent decree that subjected the RNC to reviews of its poll monitoring activities. That expired in 2017. The RNC is recruiting about 50,000 poll watchers to be on the lookout for problems on election day in 2020. Sometimes you see exaggerated claims. I mean, you'll see claims by people that, that just the fact that there's a poll watcher in the precinct, that that's somehow intimidation. That is not true. Uh, if the poll watcher is engaging in uh, intimidating behavior, you know, talking to voters, trying to coerce voters, uh, pressuring voters, yeah, that's, that's voter intimidation. But that rarely happens. Uh, election officials in every state have the ability to immediately throw out of a polling place any poll watcher that is uh, doing anything other than observing. So I think a lot of those stories are uh, frankly exaggerated. There are safeguards built into the system to combat voter intimidation. 
Poll workers who are there to help voters will make sure that poll watchers follow the rules and local election officials, voter protection hotlines and state officials are also available. There is essentially a team of lawyers in every city and town uh, on the phone and ready to help um, and and do what needs to be done and go to court if necessary to make sure that the voting happens in a smooth and orderly process. It is also against the law to deploy federal troops at polling places in state and local laws place limits on police officers. People tend to be concerned about voter int intimidation historically, but there's often, you know, at least in my data, I don't see a lot of evidence that people uh, actually when they get there, that they find that there's voter intimidation going on. But, you know, every election is different and local elect local conditions vary a great deal. With coronavirus casting a shadow over the 2020 elections, many states have made it easier than ever to vote by mail. But many Americans remain deeply skeptical of mail-in ballots. According to a Pew Research Center poll taken ahead of the November 2020 election, 43% of Republicans thought voter fraud was a major problem with mail-in ballots in past presidential elections, compared with 11% of Democrats. The Heritage Foundation listed what it said were a sampling of voter fraud instances between 1982 and 2020, including over a thousand criminal convictions, some involving absentee ballots. We need absentee ballots for people who can't uh, make it to the polls because they're sick or physically disabled or out of town. But the problem with them is that uh, they are the most vulnerable to not only uh, intentional wrongdoing, but also to errors and, and mistakes. And that's because they're the only kind of ballot that is voted outside the supervision of election officials and outside the observation of poll watchers. Uh, they also make voters vulnerable to coercion and pressure in their homes, the kind of thing that can't actually happen in polling places because that kind of electioneering is is prohibited there. On several occasions, President Trump has also called into question the validity of mail-in ballots. As far as the ballots are concerned, it's a disaster. They're sending millions of ballots all over the country. There's fraud. They found them in creeks. They found some with the name Trump, just happened to have the name Trump just the other day in a waste paper basket. They're being sent all over the place. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. But most experts say there are relatively few instances of voter fraud in relation to mail-in ballots. In September 2020, FBI Director Christopher Wray told Congress that he has seen no sign of voter fraud on a national level. Now, we uh, have not seen historically uh, any kind of coordinated national voter fraud effort uh, in a major election, uh, whether it's by mail or, or otherwise. We have seen voter fraud uh, at the local level from time to time. And some experts say that when election fraud does occur, it is usually easy to detect. In 2018, a congressional House race in North Carolina was overturned following allegations of absentee ballot fraud. And in August 2020, a New Jersey judge ordered a new election be held for a Patterson City Council seat after a city councilman was charged with voter fraud. What is a far bigger problem, according to analysts, is invalidated ballots. It is far more likely that things go awry because of human error rather than something nefarious and malicious. So people, when they are filling these out, make mistakes. It's their first time doing this. They don't know what they're doing. And they don't have the assistance necessarily of a poll worker there to help them through the process. COVID-19 has only added to those problems. In the 2018 general election, a quarter of the roughly 120 million Americans who voted did so by mail. With many people avoiding public places and more than a dozen states relaxing mail-in ballot requirements due to the coronavirus pandemic, that number is expected to surge. In general, mail-in ballots are rejected for two reasons, according to analysts. Election officials not being able to verify voter signatures and ballots arriving by mail after the deadline. So ballots are rejected because they don't meet some criteria. Either they're late or they are not signed or there's some sort of identification component missing. It's certainly going to take a lot longer in places. Places, uh, you know, don't have the experience sort of to process that many ballots. And also voters um, are more confused when they do a new experience. So the possibility of more rejected ballots increases substantially. 
During the June 23, 2020 state primary in New York City, one in five mail-in ballots were rejected for a variety of reasons, including missing signatures and ballots that arrived late. In California, more than 100,000 ballots were rejected in its March 3rd, 2020 primary, nearly 48% more than 2016. Of those ballots, 70,000 arrived late and 27,000 voters either forgot to add their signature or the signature was declared a mismatch by officials. One thing to know is that many states, at least five, have been using mail vote by mail for a long time and they're really good at it. So this is a policy that we have tried and used and succeeded at. So that's the good news. The, the next news is that we had to shift a lot of policies this year in order to accommodate social distancing, voters who are sick and managing everything that we have to manage in the midst of a global pandemic. So that makes things a little bit more complicated. But remember, um, the vast majority of Americans these days are uh, going to their grocery stores. They're going to their pharmacies. They're going to retail establishments, all of whom have put in the kind of health safety protocols recommended by the CDC and others, line spacing, you know, wearing masks, sanitation stations. There's no reason the same can't be done in, in uh, polling places. With an increased number of voting options and renewed interest in the election, turnout in the 2020 election could surge to an estimated 160 million voters, over 16 percent more than 2016. But according to a Pew Research Center poll, there's a stark contrast in how Democrats and Republicans plan to vote. The survey found 80 percent of President Trump supporters plan to vote at an in-person polling place versus 58 percent of Vice President Biden supporters who plan to vote by mail. If you vote by person, you go in, you fill out your ballot, you put it through the machine. Now, when you put it through the machine, the machine has, a, has an automatic sensor <laughs> that essentially can spit it back out at you if you voted twice for the same office or if you didn't vote for a particular office. Now, it may be that you just want to put through that blank ballot and you can force it through, which the machine will allow you to do on the second try. But the machine gives you immediate feedback about voter error. That doesn't happen under vote by mail. In the U.S., more than 80 percent of voting machines are made by three companies, Election Systems and Software, Dominion Voting Systems, and Hart InterCivic. And while the companies are private, the mostly unregulated industry has come under increased scrutiny from policymakers regarding how the machines are made and their susceptibility to hacking. In January 2020, the CEOs of the three companies went before Congress to discuss supply chain issues, cybersecurity, employee background checks, and corporate ownership. That hearing came on the heels of a July 2019 warning by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence describing the Russian government's repeated attacks on America's election infrastructure. The committee said attacks by the Russian government occurred from at least 2014 through at least 2017, and there was an urgent need to replace outdated voting systems in the U.S. with voting machines that have a paper backup. The report also said there was no evidence that any votes were changed or voting machines were manipulated. Since the 2016 election, the U.S. has taken big steps to improve its voting systems. According to experts, voting machines need to be replaced roughly every 10 years for security and reliability issues. In 2018, Congress sent $380 million to the states for cybersecurity improvements, along with another $425 million in 2020. During that time, the U.S. has also continued its transition from paperless voting machines to polling place scanners that read paper ballots, which are less vulnerable to cyber attacks. Just like everything in American elections, the state of machines varies from state to state, and different states have different rules about um, sort of reviews of the machines, whether they have audits, whether they need to inspect the machines for um, for essentially, you know, aging and getting old. There are funds that Congress put in place not only after the Help America Vote Act for all of the states to update their voting machines, but funds that were recently also sent out to update voting machines. And it's not just voting machines that are under attack. In September 2020, Microsoft said over the course of several months, it detected cyber attacks coming from groups inside Russia, China, and Iran, targeting both the Trump and Biden campaigns. The company said that the majority of attacks were detected and stopped by security tools built into its products, but indicated more attacks are expected. 
And in October 2020, national security officials said both Russia and Iran have obtained voter registration information and are attempting to influence the U.S. presidential election. But despite these issues, analysts say that because the U.S. election system is decentralized and mostly run at the local level, it makes it very unlikely voter fraud will take place on a national scale. So one of the real advantages of our election system is that it's it's it's, it's a federal system. So you have have, you know, like 4,000 election districts and they're all doing something different, you know, and they're all very localized. They're not interconnected. And this is what really makes our votes secure from hacking. There is not one place to enter. You can't grab a vote electronically and change it. Um, it's really not possible to get to the machines inside and hack them. So we have safeguards in place along the way in every step and it is a well-run machine overall that is happening across the place. So these claims of, of, of massive numbers of people doing things, again, that requires a certain amount of coordination that is just not happening. Moreover, at every step along the way, we have well thought through safeguards in place to prevent just this kind of thing from happening. 